17 years ago, I had a meeting with a gentleman named Rusty Keeley, and I shared with him that I did not know if I had what it took to become a motivational speaker, to build this business, to touch lives around St. Louis, around Missouri, maybe even as far as Illinois. And he challenged me to believe in myself, to cast a vision for impacting lives, not only in our own backyard, but around the world. Since that time, we've had the opportunity and the honor of partnering with more than 2,000 clients in 50 states, a couple dozen countries, a couple million people. We've released now a couple, that's two, number one national best-selling books and have this remarkable podcast. Thank you for listening to it. Because of Rusty's vision, because of his belief, because of his challenge for me to imagine this impact and to pursue it diligently. It has impacted my life, and not only that, but Rusty is a sponsor today of this podcast. Keeley Companies now does more than $500 million in annual revenue through construction and infrastructure technology, wireless logistics, and development solutions. It's their world-class, people-first mentality that makes the biggest impact I've seen this firsthand in my life. The team, the Keelians now feel in their lives and those that are benefiting from Rusty and the Keely work experience it in their lives. If you want to learn more about Rusty Keely and that business, I encourage you to check out KeelyCompanies.com. KeelyCompanies.com or better yet, why not listen to the Live Inspired podcast where I celebrate our relationship. Check it out. It's episode 296. You'll experience there an in-depth conversation with my friend, the CEO of Keeley Companies. His name is Rusty Keeley. Welcome to the Live Inspired Podcast with John O'Leary. John is the number one national best-selling author of the book On Fire. He's a world-class inspirational speaker, and he's the host of the Live Inspired Podcast. John interviews extraordinary individuals on their life story so that you can wake up from accidental living and more fully live your life story. Here's your host, John O'Leary. Well, hello, my friends, and welcome to the Live Inspired Podcast with John O'Leary. I want you to think about this question. What if you become successful in life? That sounds good, John. No, 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 I'm not done yet. Successful at life in the things that actually do not matter. Let me put that in front of you one more time without me whispering over my own shoulder. What if you become successful in life at things that just do not matter at the end of the day? Well, this is something that our guest today wrestled with. And I think through her experience, through her awareness, through her pushing back fear and figuring out who she was, what she stood for, and what really mattered to her, you may also recognize in your own life who you are, what maybe you fear, what's holding you back, what you stand for, and ultimately what your next best step is going forward. Our guest's name today is Paula Ferris. You may recognize that name because she was the host of The View. She was the host of Good Morning America Weekend Edition. She was wildly successful throughout network television And then one day she woke up and she recognized, and I'm missing out at home. And I'm missing out with my spouse. And I'm missing out on my spiritual journey. And I'm trading in my time at home and personally for everything that's going on professionally. I'm 100% committed at work, which means I'm not at all committed to who I am and to the values that I stand for. So Paula had some difficult conversations. She reflected. She prayed. And she made a massive pivot in her life. She's going to be talking about her life today. She's going to be talking about her journey toward the top of the ladder and then her pivot toward moving that ladder to a very different wall. It's a really cool story. But again, the reason why we share Paula's story and all the stories on the, on the Live Inspired podcast is not just to celebrate the individuals we bring on, but to make sure that we have ideas that we can pull from their stories and apply in ours. So as you get ready to listen to the remarkable, successful story of Paula Ferris, I encourage you right now to sit back, but not too far back. Don't get that comfortable. Grab a journal. Grab something to write with. Get ready to take some notes on your story, on your story, and how to ensure 
that the ladder you are climbing is resting on the right foundation and that it is leaning up against the right wall because we want you to become successful in the areas of life that matter most. We're going to be talking about that today with my friend and now yours. Her name is Paula Ferris. Paula, welcome to the Live Inspired Podcast with John O'Leary. Oh, thank you, John. I'm I'm so delighted to be here and to to just have a moment with with your people and with you. Well, and I always feel like, man, I wish the listeners were part of what we, you and I were just talking about, because some of the best stuff takes place before we record. I feel like I'm already seated across my friends today. Uh, well, you didn't record any of that because I'm if you I'm saying if if you recorded it and you want to use it, go for it. <laughs> well, uh, it's it, it was not recorded, so uh, we'll have to go right back into it now. I'm I'm always curious. We'll try to replicate what we just talked about off camera. <laughs> if if someone bumps into you up at school or you know at the local Kmart wherever it might be, and they say, "Hey, I'm I'm Michelle or I'm Billy," what do you do for a living? Yeah. When you say your name back to them and then you answer their question, how do you respond to that these right. days? It, it's a question that I think is just baked into our society. What's your name? What do you do for a living? And we ask it almost with, without even thinking of the implications. We, we ask it without thinking of what um, it truly means. And what it means is what's your name? What do you do? Because that's really your only value and your only worth, correct? And I asked that question for a long time. And my answer was I'm Paula Ferris and I'm the, I work at good morning America and the view. And that was it. And when that changed, I was like, I don't know who I am anymore. And it changed a couple of years ago when I decided to step away at the height of my career to pump the brakes. So, but now when people ask me, John, because I've gone through a season of introspection, crawling through mud and tears, not knowing who I was outside of what I did, um, when people ask me, you know, what do I do? I say, well, I'm a, I'm my, I'm Paula and I'm a wife. I'm a mom. I love Jesus. I'm a curious person who likes to ask questions and I like to champion and challenge people. And that's who I am. And that's, and, and that's what manifests in the doing, no matter where I am, whether I'm broadcasting, whether I'm podcasting, whether I'm launching a new company, which I'm God willing going to be doing, um, summer of 2021, um, taking, taking the, who I am. And then allowing that to manifest in the doing, no matter what that looks like. And it doesn't have to look like one thing forever and ever. We think we have to be one thing forever and ever. I have to, I was born to do this and I have to do this. And no, you don't, you really don't. So I'm going to, I'm going to take us back just a couple decades. We're going to leave Manhattan for a moment. We, we okay. may return here later on in the conversation. Are we going to J-Town, Michigan, where I was We're born? We're going to or? J-Town, baby. Get, get, get your <laughs> Michigan gear back on. So we are in Jackson, Michigan. Talk, talk about growing up in Jackson. What was life like for you? Oh gosh, Jackson. It's a small town near Ann Arbor. It's probably an hour and a half west of Detroit. Small town, South Central Michigan. Um, grew up with a cornfield in my backyard, um, explored. Um, I, I was outside all the time, um, but grew up in a family of four. I was the youngest, a bit of a fighter. <laughs> and the, the, the youngest tends to be the scrappy one. My siblings say I'm spoiled. I'm like, no, I'm scrappy. But it grew up in a, in, a, in a wonderful home. We didn't have a lot, didn't have a lot of money, but we had each other. My mom uh, was able to quote unquote, stay home, which she wasn't staying anywhere, but she was able to raise us um, along with my father, who was an electrical engineer and um, grew up in a faith-filled home, a Christian mutt, born into the Catholic faith. Then we switched to Lutheran church. Then I went to a Baptist high school and I went to a Bible college and the common thread through it all was we went to this ecumenical uh, group of believers called Morning Star Christian Community, and we met on Sunday nights, regardless of where you went on Sunday mornings or if you went to church on Saturday mornings. It was an ecumenical group, so we had our home church, and then we would meet with this this community of believers, Morning Star Christian Community. And it was a little Pentecostal, so mm-hmm. I've seen a little bit of everything when it comes to the the faith sphere. But yeah, grew up in a loving home. I loved it. I'm a Midwest kid at heart. When people ask who I am at my core, that's part of it. I'm a Midwest girl, uh, Midwest sensibilities. I love the Michigan Wolverines football team, even though it doesn't seem like God's been on their side lately. Um, <laughs> it's been tough, John, it's but I love, I love, I loved growing up in Jackson. It's a I really know Michigan may be tough, but Missouri's far worse. So uh, congratulations <laughs> at least on having hope uh, in, in the fall. My mother grew up in St. Louis, Missouri, and we used to call it misery. So you've got three kids, you've got a spouse, you've got a mother, but the book called out, you dedicated to your father. Yes, I did. 
my father passed away as I was writing the book. My dad was a, a flawed man and an imperfect father, but um, the greatest man that I've ever known. And I wanted to dedicate the book to him. My book called out because the book is just about really knowing who you are outside of the doing, finding out the parts of you that won't shift and shake in a pandemic when you lose your job or you lose your, your what's in your bank account or when um, you lose your status, who are you outside of that, right? And I think a lot of us are grappling with some of those questions, trying to find out the immovable, unrootable um, parts of us um, that we can cling to. We need to cling to something because when we have tied our purpose and our identity to these things that we've lost that have shifted, we don't know who we are. So it's really digging into who we are outside of what we do. And I dedicated it to my dad because he was an example of the type of life that I want to live. My dad, I, he passed away, I, I would say somewhat traumatically, you know, as I was writing the book, he had a stroke and within six months he had lost 60 pounds and he, he was paralyzed, couldn't eat, couldn't drink, couldn't swallow, couldn't speak. It was a tough way to go. Um, my dad suffered the, his, the last chapter of his life through it all. He was surrounded by family and friends. And it was such a testimony to the life that he lived one where he knew who he was. He knew who he was outside of what he did. Yes. He was an engineer. He had multiple opportunities to move up the corporate ladder, to take that job, to make more money. But he, his priority was sewing into his family and sewing into his friends. And he wanted to make sure that he was home for dinner. And that was his priority. I didn't really have a, a true grasp of not only the sacrifice th that that took, but also the impact that that had on my life until mm -hmm. my dad was on his deathbed. I'll tell you what, he, the, the last conversation that I had with my father, and it wasn't really even a conversation again, because he couldn't speak. He could nod no and, and yes, but the last conversation that we had, it was a Saturday before he passed away. And he was just, he was crying and he would cry a lot because his body was shutting down because he had lost 60 pounds because he had had a feeding tube since day one. He was in a lot of pain. And so this particular day, he was surrounded by family from all over, had, had been visiting him throughout his, throughout his time in the hospital and at the nursing home. I said, daddy, why, why are you crying? crying. And I said, are, are you sad? And he shook his head. No. And I said, daddy, are you crying because you're in pain? And he shook his head. No. And I said, are you crying because you're over, because you're overwhelmed by the love and the memories and the life that you lived? And he nodded. Yes. And it was in that moment that I realized, wow, this is the type of life that I want to live. This is the legacy that I want to leave for my children, not in doing, but in being, in investing in what's important. On my dad's um, gravestone, it says nothing about what he did for a living. It says nothing that, about him being an engineer. It says that he was a loving father, um, you know, a, a godly husband and, and a jidu, which is Arabic for, for grandfather, um, where Lebanese, my father was full, full Lebanese. And so it just was such a testimony to the life that I want to live and that, that I want the type of life and the legacy that I want to leave for my children. Um, we get so caught up in the doing and moving up the corporate ladder and my identities and what I do. And really at the end of the day, what mattered most to my father was being surrounded by friends and family, knowing that he lived a life of impact, that he lived a true life of purpose. And yes, there are sacrifices involved, but, um, what just an inspiration for me. And I say it was such great perspective. His, it was a gift. He gave our whole family a gift of what it looks like to live a life of true purpose and true meaning and to, to really root into what matters. Paul, oh, what a great way to start this conversation. I, I knew there'd be moments that were emotional. I was not expecting you to lead right into it. And, and I appreciate you doing exactly mm -hmm. that. You, you also mentioned while you're bedside with your dad, not only the love that you're feeling for him, but the questions that you're asking him. Mm -hmm. You grew up with a little subtitle, Paula. Mm -hmm. 20 Paula, questions. Paula, 20 <laughs> questions. Paula, 20 questions. So you you were made for media. You were made for this, the, the bedside manners that you mm -hmm. revealed to your dad later on in life. I was born and, nosy, John. I was and, born well, nosy. <laughs> and I'm sure some of your siblings may have felt that way, but some of your teachers did not. Mr. Barsoon mm -hmm. was one and Mr. I think K was another. Talk about what they saw in you that maybe you weren't clearly seeing in yourself. Look at you. You read the my book. I told you I'm ready to John, roll. Let's go. And John, one of the conversations we were having yeah. off camera was if you really want to conduct a good interview, good podcast, or have just a good conversation with somebody, 
you want them to feel seen and heard that you've taken the time to get to know them. Right. And you've taken the time to read my book. And I know that because of these nuanced questions, you're asking specific questions about my teachers and professors that I write about, and you put me at ease. And so now I'm probably going to open up and tell you <laughs> things that I wouldn't have shared with other people. Okay. So back to your question right. though. Yeah. So I just thought I was born curious. I asked questions. I mean, I was I remember one of my um, mom's friends would come over. Her name was um, Judy Bartell and she used to smoke. Okay. And I, every time she would come over, I would sit on her lap and I would go through her purse. She would let me go through her purse. Okay. And I would pick up, hold the cigarettes up. I'm like, you know, these are going to kill you. Right. So like I, I, since I was a kid, I, I've, I've, I've just been part of my baked into my DNA. I like to challenge people, but I love to be challenged in return. Um, I like to ask questions. I like to get to the bottom of it. I'm persistent. And it was my high school drama teacher, Mr. Barsoon, as you mentioned, who kind of spotted and noticed some of these, I guess you could call them gifts and talents. I just thought, I didn't think anything of it really. And he is the first one that, that said, you should go into broadcasting. Cause I had no idea. I didn't grow up thinking I'm going to be a broadcaster when I grow up. This is what I want to do. I want to be on good morning America. I, that, that wasn't even an option. I'm a girl, you know, uh, from a small town, small dreams. I didn't even, that, that didn't, was not even on my radar. So Mr. Barsoon was the first one that kind of spoke life into this and said, you should go to school for broadcasting. You can tell a story. Um, he would cast me as the narrator in all of our drama productions. Um, and he said, part of being a broadcaster is being curious and being able to tell a story with inflection and passion. And then once I got to college, my professors, Mr. Leitenheimer and Mr. Craigle, the K-man, we used to call him, he, they continued to speak life into this. And I say that that is kind of the, the formula for really uncovering your talents and gifts and, and, and carving out your vocational lane is finding what, what you're good at, what you love, and what trusted people speak life into and notice that you're good at and you love. Um, it's not enough just to be good at it. You have to love it. Um, you have to be both good at it and you have to love it and trusted people have to speak life into that. And so that's, they were speaking life into my curiosity and to my question asking and my champion and challenging people and my ability to connect. And that's really kind of, that's why I went into broadcasting, but I know that I can do a whole lot more than just broadcast with those particular talents and gifts, but it's a matter of peeling back those layers. And for all of us, those that are listening, who maybe feel like I have to do this one thing forever and ever. Well, uh, you know, I, I feel trapped or I'm burnt out or I don't know what I'm supposed to do, like peel back the layers a little bit and, and sit down and take some time to reflect and, and think about those three questions. What are you good at? Yeah. Okay. What do you love and what do trusted people notice that you're good at and that you love? My husband is good at leading. He's a motivator. He's a coach. He played college basketball. He was the captain of his college basketball team. He went on to coach college basketball and now hard right turn. He is managing uh, a commercial real estate firm out of, in Manhattan. I mean, we live in South Carolina, but he's managing it. And what is he doing? He's coaching, right? He's leading, he's motivating. So he's been able to use those gifts and talents on many different levels. Um, I have a friend who I asked her these questions. She said, I'm loyal and I'm an encourager. Well, she is a podcaster. She's an author and she's a counselor. So mm -hmm. you don't have to, you, you peel back those layers and then you just think, I can do a lot of things with these talents and gifts that I have. I don't have to do one thing for the rest of my life. I, the, it, it will release you to try new things, to be bold, to branch out, uh, to reinvent yourself, but always leaning on those inherent talents and gifts that you have and realizing that you can use those on many different vocational branches and in many different vocational seasons, because I firmly believe that vocation is seasonal. We're called to do different things at different times in our life. We don't feel, we shouldn't feel trapped back into a corner that we have to do this for the, at it, no matter what the paycheck is. I've been there. I've walked away from a really big paycheck, you know, and it takes Several times. risk and faith and fear and all of that, but it's also freeing to really, to realize and to lean it sorry, to lean in. I hate that word, to hit that phrase, but to, to, to lean into that. And, and, and once you do, it's so it's freeing, almost like the shackles come off. I can try new things. I can, I can be brave to try new things in new seasons because I'm going to take these gifts and talents that I have yeah. in whatever season I'm in. So I'm going to, I'm going to pull you back to something you said, Oh, I hate that. Uh, so we're going to talk about that thing. You <laughs> leaning this, in? this idea of leaning <laughs> in. Everyone is told like, that's what you should do as a woman, certainly. But as a oh, man, as a leader, in, right? as a, 
uh, as a ladder climber, lean in and go high. Let's go. Let's go. Yep. Why'd yep. you catch yourself and say, oh gosh, I'm, I'm not wild about that phrase. Because that's what yeah. society tells us. To, what's your name? What do you do for a living? That's the only thing you bring to the table. Lean in, go for that as hard as you can, right? But when that one thing changes, John, and that one thing will change, inevitably, we are going to experience some sort of shift throughout our life, whether it's a career shift, it's a financial shift, it's a relational shift. And if we are just leaning into that one thing and it pivots, then, and we have wrapped our identity in that thing. And we have wrapped our purpose into that one thing. We are not going to know who we are outside of that thing. We're going to have an identity crisis. So when I look, I'm a big fan of Sheryl Sandberg. She wrote the book, Lean In. But I just think it's a, it, at the end of the day, it can be a dangerous message because we're leaning into something that is going to shift. We're leaning into something that is going to change. Instead of focusing on what we want to do for a living, let's focus on who we are, who we want to be and invest in that. And once we invest in the parts of us that don't shift and shake in crisis, I'm curious. I ask questions. I like to champion and challenge people until we start really digging in and rooting into those things that aren't going to change about us. Um, we are, we're, we're bound for identity crisis. We're bound for some sort of crisis um, because we're rooting into things that are going to shift. Well, my friends, I'm going to pause my friend Paula here just for a moment to read to you the top of the brochure that is in front of me right now. Listen to this. Tell me if this doesn't make you want to remove your mask, board a plane, and head somewhere new. Listen to this. Flowing through six countries, the Rhine River cuts deeply through mountains, meandering between hillside castles and age-old winelands. This is Germany's landscape at its most dramatic with spectacular views of forested hillsides alternating with craggy cliffs. Idyllic villages appearing around each bend and half-timbered houses, Gothic churches that appear as if plucked from a fairy tale world. This is the Rhine as you've never seen it before. Well, this is the Rhine that we are going to see in June of 2022, I'm taking my kids, I'm taking my wife, my mom and dad are coming. We may sneak a couple other O'Leary's on the boat too. But we want to make sure that you have the opportunity to join us on what we are thinking is going to be the absolute trip of a lifetime. It's going to be awesome. It is June 8th through the 15th. It's going to be remarkable if you've ever thought about traveling through Europe or going on a river cruise or partying with the O'Leary family. All three of those are going to come into perfect unison on the Rhine in June of 2022. So if you want to learn more information about this trip, do me a favor, grab a pen, write down this number, 314-369-8232. I'll give that number to you one more time because I recognize many of you, you're still thinking about the Rhine. You're still thinking about the castles. You're still thinking about the, the Swiss Alps. you got to stop thinking about that for a moment. Take the next best step. It's to write down this number and then call my friends there. 314-369-8232. Tell them that John O'Leary sent you and you want to learn more about the trip of a lifetime down the Rhine. So I'm going to take you back. You've, you've fairly recently graduated Cedarville University. You're hanging out with a man named John Kruger. Life is good. <laughs> He's at work. You're on the treadmill. You're circa, watching circa mid nineties here, circa mid nineties. So mid nineties and then rolling into 2000 and then mm -hmm. into fall of 2001. You work in radio. You're making a lot of money, man. Radio mm -hmm. is huge in Lucrative. 2001 and you're doing advertisement. You're selling commercial space and then your life changes on 9-11 like everyone else. But yeah. what was it about that morning professionally? Mm -hmm. that caused you to take a complete pivot in your life. Right. I was making great money. I was newly married, 25 years old, making about $60,000 a year. And we're talking 2000s. Okay. So, um, and using those gifts of curiosity, I mean, I was an awesome salesperson. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I can ask questions. I can champion people. Yeah. That translates into sales, but I wasn't really fulfilled by it. And I also knew that there was something else out there. I remember my my high school teacher and my and my college professors were speaking life into me to to really to to champion me as a broadcaster an honor broadcaster but guess what when i went to college i focused on production behind the scenes um shooting editing producing and writing why because i was scared because i was so paralyzed by my fear of failure paralyzed that 
if I did go for the on-air aspect and the on-air gig, that I would say something stupid and I would make a fool of myself and what would people think of me? And I was paralyzed by that. Even though I had people speaking life into it, saying that you're, you need to do this, you're good at it. Um, and I did love it, but I was scared by it. And I was scared of the failure. Um, and it wasn't until um, 9-11 happened that I finally, I, I was just, I, I was enraptured by and captivated by the coverage yeah. of these broadcasters and reporters and journalists able to tell this tragedy with such grace, um, a moment of, of tragedy for a country able to unite us. And I, I finally saw that dream for, for myself that other people had seen for me. And I think sometimes other people see the dream for you first before you see it for yourself, because you are so paralyzed by your fear. And so it was in that moment. And I said, okay, God, I, and I'm a person of faith. I realize not everyone is, but it was this moment where I really felt God speaking to me saying in the same way as with Moses, Moses, by the way, couldn't speak, um, inarticulate. And yet Um, God called him to speak to the nation of Israel and speak to Pharaoh, like the most (laughs) powerful person on the planet. Um, He said, in the same way as of Moses, I'll be with you. And it's a a chapter from from the book of Joshua. And um, I just really felt like, okay, God, I'm going to go for this. I'm going to I'm going to finally press into my fear, because that's the thing we think that fear, there's something wrong with us if we experience fear or we think that it's our intuition calling us off. No, absolutely not. Fear is normal. Fear is mentioned hundreds of times in the Bible. Fear is something that is is something that we all experience. And I think until we kind of get used to that feeling of, okay, I'm going for it. I have a peace that I'm supposed to go for it, but I'm still scared as hell. That's okay. That's okay. Peace and fear can coexist. It's, but it was up to me in that moment to go for it. I had to step into my fear step into my paralyzing fear of failure and say, I'm going to go for it. Not only go for it, but I'm going to quit my lucrative job. Okay. So I walk away from this lucrative job. I hand out my resume at every station in Dayton, Ohio. We were living in Dayton, Ohio. My husband was a college basketball coach and I just didn't think it was fair to start sending my resume all across the country and uproot him from his job that he loved for this dream. I got a job. I got one offer to be a production assistant at KEFWRGT, it was a dual affiliation, Fox NBC station. Ian Rubin was the news director. He called me in for an interview. Uh, We've got a PA position available. Um, You'll make minimum wage. So I went from 60,000 a year to to making seven bucks an hour, but I really felt like this was what I was supposed to be doing. I had a piece about it. I was still scared as hell, but I knew that it was up to me to take those steps, okay, to go for it. And so I did. And I remember in the interview, um, Ian Rubin asked me, he said, why do you want to do this? And I said, I, well, I just really eventually want to report. He said, well, you know, that's not going to happen here. And I knew that it was a large, it was a, a, a top 50 station and you don't just start on air in Dayton, right. Ohio. And so I said, I totally get that. I just, I just want to, you know, get my sea legs. I want to get back into the business. And I feel like this is the way to go. Unbeknownst to Ian, I would borrow the equip- the camera equipment. I'd borrow all the gear from the guys in the sports department when, when I wasn't working on my downtime and I shot interviews. I filmed um, standups of myself in locations. I edited a tape and I handed it to him. I didn't think he was going to put me on the air. I just said, I just really want your feedback. Cause you know, I eventually want to be on the air. You're a news director. You're looking for talent. You're scouting for, for journalists and reporters. What do I need to do to get there? He's like, you did this all yourself. And I said, yeah, I, I can shoot and edit and produce, right? Like, you know, that's what I kind of was, what I went to college for. I'll never forget. He said, make another tape for me. And I was in the midst of making another tape and he walked up to me in the newsroom and I was prepping for one of the, one of the shows, like the 10 PM newscast. And he's like, I'm going to put you on the air. And I was like, what okay. had no idea and I was still making $7 an hour. And so I the next year. <laughs> he was um, laughing all the way to the bank. Yeah, I know. He put me on the air. I did that for about a year and I got a, a job in Cincinnati. Um, out of that, worked there for three years as the weekend sports anchor. I worked in sports for a long time. I love sports. I met my, I'm, I'm a sporty kid, not super great at playing sports, but I've loved sports my whole life. My husband played college basketball. That's how we met um, in college. And then I, we, um, after three years in Cincinnati, moved to Chicago, uh, 
to work at the NBC affiliate. And I was the lead sports anchor there for six years. And then we got called to go to New York and work at the network and work at ABC, did that for nine years. And that's where I really kind of made the transition from news to sports, but sports anchors, sports broadcasters make really good transitions because we're to the news field because we're used to tap dancing. We're used to improvising. We're quick on our feet yeah. and we're good at ad-libbing. You look at Robin Roberts and Bob Costas and, and some of the, some of the best broadcasters have a sports background fear. It has plagued me my entire life. And th- that same fear paralyzed me from getting into broadcasting. And then at the height of my career, a couple of years ago, when I was anchoring good morning America and co-hosting the view, it was that same fear. I knew in my, my spirit, I was burnt out. I needed to slow down, but I was too scared. I was scared of once again, what people would think of me, that fear of failure, that they would think that I was a failure, that I was a has-been, that I couldn't hack it. And that fear paralyzed me from doing what I needed to do to kind of get my life back. And then I I want to come back to the view and and good morning America in a moment, but a friend of mine and a guy we've had on the podcast, John Tesh Mm -hmm. entertainment tonight and hugely successful. He shared that early in his career, he knew he wanted to go to the top. Like he Mm -hmm. was driven, man. And he'll knock over walls to get there and ruin (laughs) relationships to get there and did both and did both. My sense as I read your work and I've listened to your story is that yours felt more like a pull than a push. Like you almost naturally were drawn forward Mm -hmm. up the ladder rather than choosing to keep climbing rapidly step by step. You were, you were just drawn eventually. I, I was drawn to it. And then it became uh, a bit York. of an addiction, but I never saw myself in New York. I, we, and when we lived in Chicago, I love Chicago. I'm from Michigan. My husband's from Indiana. We're Midwest kids. Never, never wanted to move to New York. I had, we had had opportunities to move there for, for other jobs. And my philosophy on New York was I like to visit, but I love to leave. I, and, and I can't tell you how many times I said, I would never live in New York. I would never move to New York. You couldn't pay me X amount of dollars and I wouldn't do it. God has a funny way, a funny sense of humor. So well, let, um, let's talk and, about that humor because yeah. I'm a St. Louis guy. Chicago mm-hmm. is our lovely big brother to the north. I love mm-hmm. Chicago. It's a great, 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 town. great city. New York, you love, you, you like to go, you love to leave. Why'd you leave Chicago for New York? I really felt this peace in my spirit. We felt a peace that we are supposed to to move. And again, it, it didn't really make sense to us. It didn't surely didn't make sense to our family. It didn't make sense to our situation. We had two little kids, four and two. I have a great job. The doors were kind of closing. And I took that as a sign because I knew I wanted to go. I wanted to transition into news from, from the sports department. It didn't mean we weren't scared. It didn't mean that we wanted to go. I really didn't want to go. All right. Cause I, I, I was content. I was in my comfort zone we were both in our comfort zone in Chicago being Midwest kids. And honestly, I think at the end of the day, that's your gut and you have to listen to your gut, whether you think that's the the spirit of God speaking to you. I firmly believe it is. I think the gut that God speaks to you through your spirit, through your, through that peace in your spirit, that gut instinct that you have, we had a peace that we were supposed to go, even though it didn't make sense. And so we did, we went. Was, Was the opportunity world news now? Yes, the opportunity was to do the overnight news, which I didn't even know ABC News had an overnight newscast. The opportunity was to work third shift. That's the other thing. Um, So I was going in at nine o'clock at night, getting home around nine in the morning and working World News Now, which was their overnight newscast. Again, I didn't even know they had an overnight newscast, but I, um, we went for a third shift job in New York City to a place we thought we'd never go with two little kids lived in Manhattan. And, um, yeah, but I think at the end of the day, you just, so you, sometimes you just know, and it doesn't have to make sense to you. It doesn't have to make sense to others. People might call you crazy, but if you have a peace in your spirit that you're supposed to go for it, expect and anticipate the fear to be there. But if you have a peace, then you proceed and things will work out, but you have to take that step. Paula, did you feel worthy is probably the wrong way to frame it, but did you feel completely qualified. Oh, absolutely Maybe not. Speaking. Imposter syndrome. Come on. Is that right? Did you feel that way? Oh, you and like you I belong and you were hoping they wouldn't find I you. I still out? feel, I still have imposter syndrome. I mean, some of my dearest friends at ABC have imposter. Michael Strahan has imposter syndrome and that affects people. If you are a driven person, you're most likely affected by imposter syndrome. You're like, what if they find out that I'm a fraud? What if they find out I'm not as qualified as right. they think that I am? 
Absolutely. I remember during my first year, I'm sitting in a room at ABC. We would have these anchor meetings like once a year where all the anchors would come in. And it was like Diane Sawyer, Barbara Walters, George Stephanopoulos, Katie Couric was there at the time, Robin Roberts. And I'm looking around the room going, what, what am I doing here? I don't belong here. I am so not qualified to be here, but that's the thing. When you are called to do something, you will be equipped to do something because it's not of your own strength. Anyway, you just have to step out in faith and obey and press into that fear, but it's up to you to take that step of faith. But absolutely. I still, I, even when I left ABC, I still was dealing with imposter syndrome and I just had to realize and accept it as part of it. You know, I, I'm not the only one that feels like this. I bet you everybody else, 90% of the people in the room feel like this. And that would give me a little bit of comfort. We could spend an hour talking about the view. We could spend an hour talking mm-hmm. about the experiences in New York. I, I think we're going to have to, though, in order to ensure we, we pivot, talk about being on top of the world. I mean, mm-hmm. you, you've done what you strive to do. You made it to the very mm-hmm. top, and yet there's still this pole. What, what were you feeling? I, I made it to the top. Absolutely. And the the world was my oyster and I was the it girl and I was burnt out. And I got to a point where like, okay, I'm, I was called to do this. Right. But if I was called to do this, why is my health suffering? Why am I not, why am I not seeing my children? Why are my quote unquote professed values clashing with the choices that I'm making professionally and personally? So there was this definite, like you said, a pull push. And I I just realized I felt this peace in my spirit, (laughs) again, going back to it, that I needed to slow down. And I didn't really know why at the time, because I was so addicted to it. Um, It work had, though I had never sought to make it to the top, it had become an addiction for me. Work became my narcotic of choice. Accomplishment and achievement and success became my narcotic of choice. And I needed more. And Paula, um, back then, did you know that or is it now? In oh, high- no. Oh, no. I, I'm not defined by what I do. Come right. on. I could walk away and I'd know who I was. And I would say that publicly. And yet when I did walk away, when I did pump the brakes, I had no idea who I was outside of what I did because my identity had been so wrapped up into leaning in, into finding this one thing I was supposed to do with my life. Again, I think if you're in that place where you are like, I'm supposed to do this, right? Isn't this my calling? Isn't this one, the one thing I'm really good at it and I still love it, or maybe you don't love it, but you know, and that's the thing, like I was burned out. I still loved it, but I was addicted to it. I think you have to ask yourself a couple of questions. A, are my professional choices and personal choices clashing with my professed values? Mine were okay. And people were suffering. And also would I know who I was outside of this thing? If it shifted, am I finding too much significance in things that shift? So, so ask I'm, yourself I'm those questions. Pause you there. Th- those questions, will you, will you state them again one more time? Yeah. So mm-hmm. if someone's driving, they may have missed the second one. <laughs> Don't drive off the road and try That's to right. take notes. But these are worth asking, like right. seriously asking and answering and being real with yourself. So and that's the thing. Questions. You have to be honest with yourself when you, when you answer these questions. The first one is if there's some sort of pull in your spirit that you need to make a shift, you want to make a shift. Typically that's that piece in your spirit. You got to listen to it. Okay. And then I say, ask yourself these two questions. The first question are your choices professionally and personally clashing with your professed values. The second question is, are you finding too much significance in this thing that shifts, whatever it may be? Would you know yourself outside of it if it shifted? And that's an indicator that, you know what? I don't just love what I do. I don't just love this thing. I'm defined by it. That's not a healthy place to be. For me, the answers to both of those were yes and yes. I was still too stubborn and I was still paralyzed by my fear my fear that yes, I had that peace in my spirit. I knew I was supposed to slow down. I felt that peace that I was supposed to slow down, but I was like, people are going to think I'm crazy. I think it's crazy. Who does that at the height of their career? People are gonna think I'm washed up, that I couldn't handle it, that I couldn't hack it, that I'm a has-been. I say some people are bold enough to make that decision and courageous enough to make the decision by answering those two questions and taking and, and taking their life back and making the necessary changes. I was so addicted to it. I was so consumed by it that 
I needed an intervention. And, and over a period of seven months, I say, God allowed this season of hell. And within seven months, it was just like one thing after another, John, that kept happening. And it was like God saying, if you don't slow down, I'm going to slow you down. Yes. Okay. And five things happened to me. I had a miscarriage with an emergency surgery. Right when I was interviewing Sean Spicer, I had this huge exclusive interview for Good Morning America. Um, then the second thing that happened after the miscarriage, I was getting ready to go live for Good Morning America and Wall Street. And some kids threw an object at my head, 60 miles an hour, concussed, um, couldn't work for three weeks. Didn't know. I was like, I was so angsty and ready to get back to work, but couldn't work for three weeks. The day I got cleared to go back to work, I get the email. I'm in the car at a red light. So excited. I get to return to work. I get to return to my identity because I don't know who the hell I am outside of it. Car crash, literally five minutes later. Then um, a couple months later, I get influenza, like the influenza, which turned into pneumonia. And I said, all right, where's my white flag? God, I'm going <laughs> to slow down. Okay. And I think, again, sometimes you, you, you can have the intellect and the discernment to answer those two questions and say, I know the answers to these and I need to be bold and, and step into my fear and step out and know that I have to listen to my body and listen to and look around and take stock of what's going on around me. And other times you need to be slowed down because you're too dumb and too stubborn. And that was me too dumb and too stubborn. And so God had to intervene. I walked away kicking and screaming, John. It wasn't like, oh yes, I'm, I want to do this. No, I was like, I am crazy as hell. I remember an executive told me from ABC that I was crazy to step away, that I was crazy to pump the brakes, to walk away from Good Morning America weekends, anchoring the show and to walk away from co-hosting The View into this unknown space. But it was in that space. That's where I found out who I was. It was really painful. And that's why I wrote the book because I was like, I was just doing what, what I was supposed to, right? I was just leaning in. I was doing what society told me to. I was doing what all the all the, the rah-rah coaches and motivators tell me to, to lean in, to find my thing, to go for it, to find my purpose. But I thought that was my purpose. And I thought that was my identity. And now I don't know who I am. That is a key piece. So for those of us who recognize it is time to slow down, we don't, we don't need the five events you had sequentially to force our hand. We recognize it not. is time to pivot. <laughs> Others just are thinking there's a nag and we need to do something else, but we're not even sure what that might be. Mm -hmm. How do we begin asking ourselves and reflecting and praying and figuring out what maybe the next best step is? That's the thing. We want to know what it is before we take a step, right? Think about when you're in the car, and you plug something into your GPS and like you're starting out in a parking lot, okay? You know how you don't know if I, wait, I, I, I'm here, but I don't know how to start the journey. I don't need to, I, am I supposed to go left out of here? Or am I supposed to go right? And you take a right and it like reroutes and you're like, oh, I jerked the wrong turn, right? <laughs> we wanna know what the next chapter looks like. But if you have a piece, you proceed, you step into your, into your fear, you step out in faith, you have to take a step in order to see the next steps. It's just like the GPS. It's not going to tell you where to go unless you start moving. Okay. You need to start moving and go and go in the direction and follow your gut, follow that piece, even though it doesn't necessarily make sense, but you have to take a step for people of faith out there. Like me, um, when, when God was telling Joshua to take down the city of Jericho, he told him to circle seven times, right? I don't know why uh, he didn't tell him I need you to circle seven. He just said, circle, just keeps, just start circling. And it's in the circling. So often we know I'm supposed to, I think I'm supposed to go do this thing, but you're in the season of circling. You're in a season of like, I don't know what the hell is going on around me, but that's where the growth happens. That's where God is testing you. He wants to make sure that you trust him. You have to step out in faith. You have to obey. And then it's time to take down the city. Right. But when he told Joshua to take down the city, he said, have I not commanded you to be strong, to be courageous. Don't be afraid. Don't be discouraged for the Lord, your God's with you everywhere you go. We are commanded to step into our fear. Have I not commanded you, John, to be strong, to be courageous. Don't be afraid. Don't be discouraged. A, we're commanded to, to, to step into our fear. B, it's acknowledged. God acknowledges that we're going to be scared. There's nothing wrong with you if you feel fear. Okay. But it's up to you to take that step into it. You know that God vouches for it. God says it's going to be there, but he also promises in the same way as with Moses, I'll be with you. But the peace of God, which transcends all understanding will guard your heart. You have to take that step. Have I not commanded you to be strong, be courageous for the Lord, your God's with you everywhere you go. God's got you, but you have to take a step. You got to get in the car. You got to start moving. You got to start driving. And 
it's impossible. We want to see the next chapter, but that's not how it always works. I didn't know it was what it was on the other side of it. I just knew I needed to slow down. And it has been so beautiful to see how things have worked out. When I first slowed down, I stepped into a, a Monday through Friday schedule. I launched a podcast, but then my career at ABC ended in November of this past year. Not exactly how I thought it was going to. Sometimes change is chosen for us. Sometimes we get to choose it. Regardless, it set us on an uncomfortable path. We didn't think that we were ready for a, a path. We didn't necessarily foresee for ourselves. We ended up in South Carolina from the bright lights of New York city. And uh, we wanted to be near family. We came down here at the beginning of the pandemic in March of 2020. And we just felt a peace that we were supposed to stay down here. And we're like, mm -hmm. uh, why this is a small town, like 4,000 people. What are we supposed to do down there? What, why are we supposed to stay down there? And we just felt this piece we were supposed to, even though it didn't make sense. Again, my husband's managing a commercial real estate firm. I'm getting ready to leave ABC, trying to figure out what's next. We followed that piece. We stepped out in faith, pressed into our fear. And, and it's scary, but it's part of it. It's part of it. And like, God has not just shown up. He has shown off out of the blue. I got approached over the summer to do a podcast, K-Love and Access More. Just launched that in February of 2021, I'm going to be launching a company, something that's been on my heart for seven years to do, but something I didn't feel qualified or capable to do because I'm a broadcaster, right? I'm a, not a business person, but once again, I've had to step through those fears of fear of how people would see me in a different capacity. Do I see myself in a different capacity? But Hey, guess what? What am I good at? And what do I love? And what do people say that I'm good at? And I love, I'm curious. I ask questions. I like to champion and challenge people. And I'm going to take that to this new phase of life. Everything that I do, whether it's this new company, whether it's the podcast, this is the core of who I am. This is who I want to be. Okay. And the doing is going to change, but I am so trying to root into who I am and the parts of me that don't shift and shake. It doesn't matter what life throws at me. It's not going to, it's not going to knock me over like it once did. I'm curious about that. It's a wonderful pivot from New York, from the craziness into where you are right now, into faithfully stepping forward, into focusing on your family and being a, a spouse and a mom and a daughter and all the roles that you're loving right now. And you're rolling out this podcast and you've got this incredibly beautiful book and you're about to build this next business. And so as you step forward, what I can see happening, if you're not highly intentional, is you'll end up in the exact same place you, yep. you began. Mm -hmm. You'll be on top of the ladder, looking out Burn exhausted out. and burned out and, mm -hmm. and just disenfranchised with the life that you're living again. So how are you going to be more intentional this time to ensure that does not happen? Absolutely. And that's a great question because I think for so long, um, my kids had to fit into my career and I am trying to be very intentional that whatever I choose to do has to fit into me being a mother first. So my kids are in school right now. Okay. And you, your team and my team had to go back and forth to make sure we could do this at an appropriate time, because I'm like, I'm only going to record these when my kids are in school. So I think it's setting boundaries. Okay. And making sure that I am that, that I'm intentional and I'm only focused on things that I am super passionate about. Okay. Things that, that I feel led to in this season, but it's about setting boundaries. It's and saying No, I've said no to so many things. Um, I had opportunities to work at other networks. I remember a friend of mine say, you built this incredible career in broadcasting. You can't just disappear into the ether. And I said, I'm not, but also why can't I, why can't I offer him for a bit? Why can't I focus on my kids? Why can't vocation seasonal? We can do different things in different seasons that we're called to. And I know my worth isn't, isn't rooted in the doing anymore. So that gives me permission to try new things, to pause if I want to, to off ramp. And yes, there's a huge financial component. That's why we had to leave New York City. You can live for like 90% less down here in South Carolina, you know? But for me, I am very intentional about what I'm allowing on my plate. I'm saying no, and I'm setting strong boundaries. And I'm making sure that I'm investing in what's most important. And if it conflicts with my values, if it conflicts with my number one priority of spending time with my children and raising my children, then I'm going to say no. Paula, I think in many regards, COVID has been a magnifier of issues that were existing before COVID. Mm. So it's not like there's anything new under the sun. It just showed us even more clearly some of the challenges we have. And You're right. Mm -hmm. For the moms listening right now and for the dads, for those of us who are trying to raise kids and climb 
and serve and return emails and be on Zoom calls and do everything else that we're doing, moving in a million miles an hour, never really being able to fully rest. What, what advice would you maybe give us who are struggling during the season that we're currently living in? I don't think anybody really has perfected it or figured it out. So it's okay to, to not be okay. And it's okay to feel like, I don't know what I'm doing. I think you have to give yourself lots of grace. One thing that, that really helps me um, just giving myself grace, if it's not going to matter in five years, is it going to matter in five minutes, putting things in perspective. I also, something that helps me decide what's a value and what's not a value is called my front porch mentality. I fast forward to the 70 year old version of myself, sit in my front porch, sip in a choice beverage. My 70 year old version look, is looking back at this moment, February, March, 2021, whatever decision is facing you, how would she or he make that decision for you? And that really helps with perspective. Good. Um, and clarity. Okay. But I think give yourself grace, try to set boundaries, try to set boundaries. Um, you cannot do it all. You can say, no, you need a community. Um, but look, we're all in this together. We're all trying to figure it out. And there's no such thing as perfection. It's about, um, giving yourself as much grace as you give other people. And, it's, it's a, it's a tough moment, but also just like really rooting into to who you are, knowing that, that you can, you know, opportunity can come from the tragedy too. Like you said, it's a magnifier, um, to kind of focus on some of the opportunity that's come out of, of such a, a, a dark time, because those two things can coexist, but be kind to yourself, give yourself grace, give your kids grace, yeah. really give your kids grace. I mean, it's, it's not about being perfect. It's about loving each other um, through the muck and mire and the flaws and the failures. And um, just, yeah, give yourself tons of grace. It's not about perfecting and finding the one thing that works for you because it might work for three days and then it doesn't work anymore. Um, but as a parent, give yourself boundaries and lots of grace. So I, I just love the fact that from the top floor of the tallest building in any, in New York, you decided to take the elevator back down and have end up, ended up in a un unquestionably far better place as a spouse, as a woman, as a mom, as a friend, and now as a professional getting ready to move in, in the next best step in your journey. It's incredibly inspiring, Paula. And I, oh, thank you, I John. appreciate you sharing some of your time with us. We have seven questions that we end every podcast mm -hmm. with, and we ask all of our great guests and you're, you are now a, part of this journey with us. So question number one of Paula Ferris is this, Paula, as you look back at your life, what's the most influential book or best book mm. that you've ever read? Um, it's a tie between the five love languages by Gary Chapman and the case for Christ by Lee Strobel. Wow. Awesome. Love those books. Five love languages was, I think it's a great social experiment to find out how people tick. And so what's, once, what's, what's your love language? Um, I am acts of service and physical touch. So big time. I'm like my husband, I remember he bought me a nice piece of jewelry for one of our, um, for one of our, uh, anniversaries. And I was like, uh, just bring me a cup of coffee at work. And that's that. Cause I'm like, this doesn't do anything. I was like, can you take it back? Um, I am big acts of service. And also like, I love um, physical touch. I'm like my husband, I'm always asking for a back rub or a foot rub. Um, and he is words of affirmation big time. So what, but it's also helped with my children and my friends being able to connect with them because you, oh, yeah. you know, so often you say if they loved me or if they really cared about me, they would do this, but then you're not speaking the same language. And it's like, duh, you read it and you're like, ah, now, aha. I think it'll give you a huge aha moment. And also the case for Christ separately. I'm a journalist, but I also love, um, I, I think a person of faith cannot just say they believe what they believe because that's how they were raised. You need to have a reason for the hope that is within you. You should be able to explain it. Okay. Yeah, right. Those skeptics to the skeptics, you need to be able to explain for the hope that is within you outside of just saying it's how I was raised, have some intellectual answers, have some scientific anthropological, you know, psychological proof and there it's out there. And that's a great book to provide. Great answer. I what, hope these aren't supposed to be, is this supposed to be a lightning round? I'm sorry. Cause it's not a lightning. It's a and You know what? Roll. It's just lightning. You know, sometimes in the Midwest <laughs> lightning storms can go on for a couple of days. So you, you take your time. We're going to get through these when you're ready to get through them. 
And the two books you shared are phenomenal. And Chap, and he's been on our show. He's a phenomenal human mm-hmm. being. Thank you for bringing him up. What What is one positive character or one trait that you possessed as a little girl growing up in Jackson that you wish you exhibited as brilliantly today? I don't need to actually think I have an answer to that because I'm such a healthier version of, of myself now than I was. And so- We've I don't had know like- Probably I don't know if I've had an answer. 400 times asking that question, 400 answers. You're the first, Apollo Ferris first, <laughs> to say, O'Leary, I got nothing for you, man. I am far <laughs> healthier now than I was as a six year old climbing trees in Jackson. <laughs> Okay. I, oh, okay. I do have one thing. I just, I wish I could tap into. It's just that carefree nature who was out just hanging out with her friends all the time. Didn't all the time. Didn't have a care in the world. So Paula, if your home caught fire in South Carolina mm-hmm. and your little puppy is out and your children are out and John is out and everybody's safe, you have an opportunity to run in and grab one thing. Mm-hmm. What's the one item that you would race back in and come running? Back well, I have with? a, I have a fireproof box, which has a lot of my sentimental things in it, but, um, it's not just, it would be all my photo albums. If you could sit on a bench and have a long conversation on a perfect day with anybody, living or dead, who do you want to be seated right next to? Bono. Wow. Have you, have you interviewed Bono before? No, I'm putting it out there though. I really want to interview Bono. Bono, I I know he's a listener. He and my mom are avid listeners of the Live Inspired podcast. So Are they really? I'm sure. I mean, we're Irish brothers, man. I'm sure he's tuning in right now. (laughs) All right. I can play some of his songs on on the piano just a little bit. So uh, when you're interviewing him, I'll be quietly playing a little uh, Josh Wittry. Please do. A little with or without you. Ask him, what's your leading question of Bono? I want to, I really want to explore his faith, what he really thinks is going to happen, you know, when this life is over for him, because I think he's such, he's such a mysterious figure, um, such an influential figure. Um, But yet I think there's this deep spiritual side of him that um, hasn't really been tapped into. And I'd really like to explore that side, what he really believes about life. My my understanding is he's a very faithful guy. And I have a feeling Mm -hmm. you will have that conversation and it will be a phenomenal conversation. Mm -hmm. So the next question, Paula, is what's the best advice that you've ever received? I know the worst advice. Um, No, the best we're not going to go negative. We're not going to go negative. The best advice I think that I've received is it, it has to do with fear. Instead of just focusing on the worst thing that can come out of it, what's the best thing that can come out of it? And so it's, it's really helped to change my mindset when I'm faced with that big decision. Mm-hmm. Not what's the worst thing that can come, what's the best thing that can happen? And it's just a matter of changing your paradigm and your perspective. 20-year-old version of yourself, you're at Cedarville University. What advice would you whisper into her, her ear? If you could kind of go back in time and whisper a little bit of encouragement, what would you tell her? Have fun. I was so focused on grades and, and the doing and working and paying for college that I, I, I wasn't as focused on the relationships as much. And you know, I would just say, you know, focus on what really matters and also give yourself grace. It's okay not to be okay. It's okay to make mistakes. And guess what? Your biggest flaws and your biggest failures are probably going to be your greatest successes. Paula Ferris, it has been said that all great people can have their lives summed up in one sentence. How would you like your one sentence to read? I, I, I will go back to my purpose statement. My name is Paula. I'm a wife, mom, Jesus follower. I'm curious. I ask questions and I like to champion, challenge, and connect people. You know, you're not what you do. You're who you are and whose you are. And reveal that through your work and through your life and through this conversation. So Paula, thank you for the time today. Thank you, John. It was such an honor. I appreciate it so much. The book is called the Paula Ferris podcast about. What is the Paula Ferris podcast about? The Paula Ferris podcast, really creative name. I know. Um, But launch this podcast because it's the journalist in me that wants to really tell these undertold and untold stories, the inspirational aspects to people's lives to really encourage and equip people and connect them to tools that will help them be the best version of themselves and live the life that they were meant to live. So I'm talking with friends old and new about the really encouraging, inspirational, um, equipping aspects of their lives. And it's all to encourage the listener. Well, the time is right. So Paula, thank you for your time, my friends. That is Paula Ferris. My name is John O'Leary, and this is your day. Live Inspired.
Well, my friends, I want to thank you for joining us for the Paula Ferris conversation. Uh, she's a delight. She's incredibly sincere. She's wildly successful, but brilliantly humble. I, I just love visiting with her. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I enjoyed bringing it to you. But in addition to that, if you'd like to learn more about living that message, about embracing your identity, about recognizing some of the fears that hold you back, about becoming more clear on your purpose, on your passion, on your dreams, on your vision, on your calling in life. Well, that's what we stand for here at Live Inspired. So grab your pen. No, this time's not for the Rhine. This time is for you to sit back and take the next right step in your journey. This is our podcast line. This is this is our line that allows us to meet you where you are on Saturday mornings. I send out a video message every Saturday directly into your life that captures these messages, that adds a little bit of context, a little bit of clarity, I think a lot of inspiration, but also a clear next step that you can take in the journey forward. So here it is, my number, 314-207-5010. Please text that number. And please text the word PODCAST2021. It turns out that so many of our listeners were saying, we love what you're talking about. We love the guests that you're bringing on, but we want clarity on how to move forward. That's what this is. That's what this is. So join us. Let's continue the conversation. Text me at 314-207-5010 and then text the word PODCAST2021. This is the way that we can send you messages that will reignite the buzz and give you clarity on how you can live this message each day in your life. I'm looking forward to seeing you through our Live Inspired Together community. So my friends, for this time and until next time, my name is John O'Leary and today is your day. What a gift. Live Inspired.